Welcome to this third lecture. So this third lecture is a little bit special. Actually, I wrote it in the notes, so it depends on you. So let me explain it. So I mean, somehow this is like a weird course because I'm not seeing you, so I don't have the feedback. I don't know if you are understanding, following or not, <laughs> and I cannot ask you. So, I mean, I cannot ask, do you know this? Do you need me to explain it? <laughs> so basically for the lecture today, you have like three options. So first option, you already know a lot about curves, varieties, abelian varieties. Okay, congratulations, you can skip this lecture, go to the next video. <laughs> you don't need this uh, lecture. Second case, well, actually, you know a little bit, you know about, a bit about curves, varieties, but I mean, you are not that sure that you really know what you need to know for following this course on Diophantine geometry. Then you are welcome to follow this lecture, because right now I'm just going to state like the result, the concept that you are going to use for the following lectures. And then there is a third option that is like, Oops, I'm sorry, actually I don't know anything about curves or varieties. Okay, so then in this case, maybe, so try it, but maybe this lecture is going to be a little bit high level for you. So in this situation, what I recommend to you is that you just take a book that talk about curves, varieties, and you try to read it. So of course, follow this lecture, so you will see which ones are the main ingredients and the concepts and definitions that we are going to use during the rest of the course. But I really suggest you to look at another book. So in my no notes, uh, you have some links. So you can look at those links and at those references. So I'm telling you like precise references that you can look at it. Okay, so I hope that some of these options are good for you <laughs> and you can follow them. And I mean, I'm going to start with the, with the, with the course. Okay, so today is lecture three. And we are going to see some concepts about curves and varieties. So, I mean, of course, you are really welcome to ask me questions so by email, by the online platform, and I mean, I really encourage you to do it. So please ask if there is something that you don't understand or there is something that you would like to have like an extra reference. So, I mean, this is my job <laughs> to answer your questions. So really feel free to do it, ask me. Okay, so I'm going to start with the definition of what is, I didn't write the adjective projective, but I mean, I mean projective curves and varieties. So I'm just going to start with the definition of what it is a uh, projective variety. So, I mean, really, this is going to be just like a simplification of a course. So I'm going to be maybe a little bit fast. So, I mean, it depends on your level. That's the problem. And I don't know what is your level. And I'm sure that you don't have, all of you, you don't have the same level. <laughs> so for some students, this is going to be very good. And for some others, it's not going to be that good. But the idea is that I'm going, I'm just going to recall, recall some of the concepts. Okay, so I mean, I'm assuming that you're a little bit familiar with all this theory. So what is a projective variety? So I mean, the idea is as follows. So let's start with an ideal. So what is an ideal? An ideal at the end is generated by some polynomials. And we are going to consider a little bit later those polynomials as the equations defining the varieties we are going to work with. So we consider I, an ideal in n plus one variables. Why n plus one variables? Because I'm going to look at projective varieties. So when we work in Pn, we actually have n plus one variables. Okay, so this is why. And I'm going to ask the ideal. So I'm not taking any ideal. So I'm just taking ideals that they are generated by some polynomials and we ask those polynomials to be homogeneous. So that means that those polynomials, they are polynomials on n plus one variables, and such that all the terms of each polynomial have the same degree. So for each polynomial, all the terms have the same degree. But I'm not really asking about all those generators to have the same degree. So different generators may have different degrees, but they have to be homogeneous. 
Okay, so we are going to look, we are interested on, in this kind of ideals. Okay, so in this situation, we can define an algebraic set as follows. An algebraic set is going to be the collection of points in Pn such that f of p is equal to zero for all f in the ideal. So this is the definition of what it is an algebraic set. So, I mean, actually here we have the explanation about why it's important to get the ideal generated by homogeneous polynomials. Because if it is not generated by homogeneous polynomials, then this condition doesn't make sense. So it doesn't make sense to ask about a predictive point to be equal to zero. So, I mean, if you want, this is the typical example. Imagine that I get this point, okay? And I get this polynomial that is not an homogeneous uh, polynomial. So I do this. So, I mean, this is not homogeneous, right? And if I evaluate f into 1, then I get 0. But what is the problem? That this is a predictive point. So instead of taking to 1, this is also equal to, for instance, for uh, 2. Right? So, I mean, I could also evaluate this polynomial in 4, 2. And then what I get? 4 minus 8 minus 4, that is different from 0. So it is not well defined what's the meaning of a polynomial to be equal to zero at a predictive point if the polynomial is not homogeneous. So, I mean, this is the standard motivation about why we need to consider here ideals that they are generated by homogeneous polynomials. Mm, very good. So, I mean, this is the definition of an algebraic set. Now we can do like an inverse construction, right, that is defining the, the ideal corresponding to an algebraic set. And, I mean, this is going to be the set of polynomials in n plus 1 variables, homogeneous, because of the reason I just explained, such that they are equal to zero at all the points in the variety. So, ah, sorry, it's not the set, it's the set generated by <laughs> those functions. So, I mean, we are not going to use it, but I mean, I guess that this, you know it, and if you don't know it, it's funny, but there is kind of a relation between these two constructions that is not trivial. So if you are curious about it, I invite you to take it. But we, we won't need it. Okay, so now we say that B, an algebraic set, is a variety if the ideal associated to it is irreducible. So basically this means that you get what is called sometimes irreducible variety. So for us variety we are going to include the word irreducible, but that means that for instance you don't get two lines like this, because this is not irreducible, this is the product of two things. So you really want irreducible things. Or if you want, this is equivalent to ask this ideal to be a prime ideal, okay, because this is not area. So, it is a prime idea. So, another concept that we can define attached to a variety is the coordinate ring of the variety and coordinate ring that is a ring that is made of all the polynomials in the n plus 1 variables that we have, but we do the quotient by the ideal associated to the variety. So this is the coordinate rate. Once that we have the coordinate, coordinate ring, we can also define the function field. So what is the function field? And it is the node like this. So look, the notation is almost the same that the, for the coordinate ring. But I mean, this is like this, and it's because actually it's almost the same thing. <laughs> so this is just a field. So we get the field of fractions of the coordinate ring. 
So, I mean, the feel of fraction construction is kind of the same thing like if you think about the, um, the integers. So the integers is a ring and a natural way of constructing uh, a field is that you allow, you can invert the elements in the ring. That means that you allow denominators. So this is kind of the same construction. So basically these fields are just the fractions um, where the numerator and denominator are elements in the coordinate ring. Okay, so this help us to define what is the dimension of a variety. So, yeah, I, I, I know, maybe I'm going too fast, I don't know, it depends on your level. <laughs> but I mean, I hope that for people that is already a little bit familiar with all these uh, things, I mean, this is like a good recall to be ready to follow the, the next uh, lectures. Okay, so now I'm going to define the, the dimension of a variety. So the dimension of, vari of a variety is by definition the cruel dimension of the coordinate ring. So what is the cruel dimension of a ring in case you don't know it? It is actually the longest length of a chain of prime ideals one contained in the other. So this is the longest length of a chain of prime ideas. So I can be more precise. <laughs> so basically you consider all the chains of prime ideas like this. Well, I mean, of course, they are different. So you take the longest one that you can get and the length is this index B. So this longest value corresponds to the dimension, the cruel dimension of the ring. And this is the way in which you define the dimension of, the, of a variety. Now, what is a curve? A curve is a variety of dimension one. Okay, very well. So next thing I want to talk about. So, I mean, I asked, I have already asked the variety to be irreducible. So somehow I'm avoiding these kind of things, right? That for instance, I have two lines or I have a conic and a cubic, something cutting in several points. So I have to curve like this. So I'm avoiding this. So somehow if I want to avoid this kind of pathologies <laughs> is because I want to avoid to have those kinds of singularities, let's say. But what is a singular point? Because even if I'm um, not letting having this thing, like something that is not irreducible, I may have something that is irreducible and that I still have singularities, right? Because I may have something like this. This is irreducible, but I have a singularity. So I need to define what is a singularity if I want to avoid them, or maybe I don't want, <laughs> but if I want to characterize them. So for this, I need, so I'm going to give like two definitions and they are equivalents. It's not that easy to prove the equivalence of those two definitions, but I mean, they are good for several reasons. So the first one is the abstract one, and it is interesting because I don't need to consider um, equations of the curve. So it is an intrinsic definition. And the other one is going to be practic because yeah, you really need to look at the equations <laughs> of your curve and to make some computations to check if the point is singular or not. But I mean, it's like an easy criterion and it's easy to check if a point is singular or not by using it. So I'm going to give the two definitions. So we take a point P on a variety and I'm going to define this ideal that corresponds to the functions on the coordinate ring such that they are equal to zero in the fixed point. So I can look at this ideal and even I can look at this ideal as an ideal, not in here, but in the localization of this ring by this ideal. So that means that I look at fractions 
such that the numerator is in here and the denominator is not in here, in this ideal. Okay, so basically it means that I, you can divide by elements, by functions, that they are not equal to zero in the point. So what happens is that then this ideal, well, what happens, I call it like this, is the localization, I'm going to write it, maybe it's better. So this is the set of fractions such that f for the numerator you can get whatever you want, but in the denominator you get not whatever you want, <laughs> but something that is here and not in here, so it's not equal to zero on the point. So what happens is that this is a local ring with a only, so local ring means that it only has one maximal ideal, local ring with maximal ideal MP. So we can extend this definition that I gave with functions in here, you can see it with functions in here. So you can see this as an ideal in this ring. Okay, so we do this definition. I know, it's technical, I told you <laughs> it was going to be technical. Um, and now I define definition, the tangent space of the variety at that point, so P, P, V, to be equal to the dual of this. So this looks complicated, I know. This is a coefficient of this ideal by the square of the same ideal. So this thing happened to be a vector space, a vector space over k. And it happens to be a finite vector space. So you can compute the dimension, sorry, I didn't wrote it, it's the dual of all this thing. So this happened to be a vector space. So now if you have a vector space, well, you know how the dual behaves. It's easy, it's a finite, finite dimensional vector space. So now with this definition of the tangent space, we say that P is a smooth or is the same thing, non-singular, If and only if, so this is by definition, the dimension of this tangent space is equal to the dimension of the variety. Okay, so this looks technical. I, I didn't see it, but okay, I'm going to basically just state like all those definitions and results that we need. So everything a little bit technical, but you know, I like examples, I love examples, so I'm going to finish with an example. <laughs> so, I mean, I hope that with the example, all those computations that I'm doing here, they make clear, and I mean, everything is going to be like very explicit. Mm, okay, so this is the abstract criterion, this is the definition, and this is intuitive, right? So, yeah, let's go to the intuition. I also like the intuition, you know it. So, I mean, something is smooth, if a point is a smooth on a variety, so yeah, I mean, I'm drawing uh, curves because it's easier. <laughs> I cannot easily draw a variety on, on a blackboard, on a two-dimensional thing, but I can draw curves. So basically, a point, we have the intuition that is going to be a smooth, so non-singular, if the tangent space have the same dimension than the curve. So in this case, it's one and one, right? So in this case, that we have a singular curve, because we have this singular point, how can we notice that it is a singular point? Because if we look at the tangent, actually the tangent, what is the tangent? So, I mean, actually the tangent is two lines. So if the tangent is a thing generated by all the tangent lines, actually we get that these two lines generate everything. So they generate something of dimension two. So we don't have this equality. So, well, I mean, I hope at least at the intuition you have it there. Okay, so now let's go to the effective uh, criterion, the one that we, we do by hand, I mean, we do in the examples. So, I mean, this criterion is based on the Jacobian matrix that I guess that you already know because you have seen it like in some calculus or analysis courses. 
Okay, so in practice, when we have a particular curve and a particular point, and we want to check if it is singular or not, we are going to use what it is called the Jacobian criterion. So the idea is as follows. So imagine that your variety is given by the algebraic set associated to an idea, and I'm going to write explicit generators. So F1, Fn. So each of them is a homogeneous polynomial in here. So n plus 1 variables. So everything is quite explicit. So now with all these, we have that p, a point in b, is as smooth if and only if the rank of the matrix that I'm going to write here, so you consider the partial derivative of all the polynomials that generate the ideal of your variety, and the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to each of the variables. So this gives you a matrix of side m times n plus 1. So, I mean, you can compute the rank of this matrix. And the rank of this matrix is going to tell you if the point is smooth, because it is smooth, if and only if this equals n minus the dimension of b. Why? Because somehow this is going to generate the tangent. <laughs> So, and you expect that the dimension of the tangent plus the dimension of the variety gives you n. Okay? So, this is the Jacobian criterion. So, um, yeah, something, I'm not going to use it that much, but I mean, I want you to be able to compute this thing in practice. So, we are going to see, to see it in an example. But, I mean, this is useful to study the reduction of a variety. So, what is the reduction of a variety? Imagine that you define your variety to be defined over the, over the rationals. So, assume you have a variety defined over the rationals. Of course, we're going to be able to do this like for any, uh, for any number field or for any field in which you have evaluation. Okay? But, I mean, let's take a particular example. So, you have a variety defined over the rationals. So, this means that the ideal associated to your variety is going to be generated by some polynomials, homogeneous one, with rational coefficients. But, I mean, of course, I can remove denominators, right? Because, I mean, the ideal generated by this is the same thing that the ideal generated by each of these elements times 7 for instance. So, with this, what I mean is that I can assume the fi to have coefficients in z, in the integers. So, now I can do the reduction modulo p. So, let p be a prime number. So, I can define the reduction of the variety given by the variety associated to the ideal that is the reduction generated by the reduction of each of these equations. So, I mean, as you see, this is totally general. I mean, I, I'm considering this example, but I just want to be able to do the reduction model or something. So, this gives me a new variety, but this time this variety is defined over the finite field with p elements. Right? I can write it like this, or I mean, this is the same thing that if I write it like this. So now notice that there is something that may happen. I may be started with a, a, a smooth variety. So a variety it is a smooth if all the points are smooth. Right? Okay, very good. So I don't have any singular point on here. But now what may happen? It may happen that when I do the reduction and I want to check if I have Mm, singular points, it may happen that now I have singular points. Because what do I have to do to check if I have singular points in here or not? I have to look at the rank of this matrix. And this matrix, I mean, it's the same one, I just did the derivatives. The only thing is that now 
here I have the reduction. So it may happen that this becomes equal to zero. Oh, sorry, that this becomes smaller than this. That the rank is smaller. Then I don't have the quality. Then I don't have that the point is smooth anymore. So I may have singularities. So I say that B has bad reduction. So assume that it was smooth when we, when we started with over the rationals. So we say that B has bad reduction if B has singular points. Otherwise, we say that it has good, uh, bad, good reduction. So if there is no singular point, it has good reduction. And I mean, something that is important is that, of course, this depends on the model. So what is the model? The model are the explicit equations I, I, I'm getting. So it may happen <laughs> that if I start with a curve that has bad reduction at three, I may find a different model of my curve that has good reduction at three. And I mean, actually, well, I mean, this would give for another whole full course studying the reduction of curves and varieties. So I mean, this is in general a very complicated um, question, but I mean, I guess that would did you have enough. For, for, I mean, for the things that we need for this precise course, <laughs> okay? Mm, okay, very well. So now I need to define something else. I need to define differential forms. So differential forms, they are a vector space. So, well, the definition is not very abstract, you will see. So basically, is the vector space, the k vector space, sorry, the k, well, I, I'll write it. <laughs> a vector space generated by symbols like this, where f is a function. And I consider those symbols with a relation that I'm going to do. So you see the generator, this is a k of b vector space. And the equivalence that we consider here are actually that d of this is equal to this and d of fg is equal to fd of g plus g b of f. So, I mean, basically, let's look at those conditions. Those are the standard derivation conditions that we have on functions. So, I mean, it's, they are natural. But, I mean, so far, the way I define it, I'm not doing nothing else that, I mean, I take those as an abstract symbol. I look at them as a generators, generators for a basis of a KV vector space over this field. And I have those relations, that's all. So this is the, I mean, later there is a more intrinsic definition if you want more geometric, but I mean, for us, it's enough with this. So I, I, I don't need to say nothing else. Okay, so um, what else can I say now? Yeah, this is a vector space. Well, this is a little bit weird, but well, I'll write it here. So I said it is a vector space, and actually it is a finite dimension vector space, and I'm not going to prove it, but actually what we have is that this space of differential form, actually of one differential forms. This one is because later you can generalize it and talk about R differential form, but we are not going to do that. So it is a vector space, and actually you can see it as the direct sum, E equal to one to N, where N is the dimension of the variety. So in particular for curves is one, so here you only have one, of something like this. So these TIs that give me a base for this vector space, um, they are called local parameters. But this is just a base, okay, of this vector space. 
Mm, very well, what else do I need? Okay, yeah. I talk about varieties and we have all these. Mm, I can talk now about morphisms between varieties. So a rational map phi phi from one variety to another one, I mean, is just something. So assume those are the coordinates. So this variety is contained in Pn and this variety is contained in Pm, right? So it is just a map that sends a point given by coordinates like this to a point on Pm. But how is described this point? It is described by polynomials. So let me denote all this by x, so I don't have to rewrite it many times. <laughs> so you send it to something like this, where the fi are homogeneous polynomials. And this time I have to ask them to be of the same degree. because otherwise I wouldn't be getting here a well-defined predictive point. So, of course, I'm not going to write it, but I mean, you have to choose the polynomials well chosen in the sense that what you are defining here is indeed a point on this variety, okay? So, this is a, a rational map, and you say that a rational map is a morphism if it is defined everywhere. So what is the meaning of this, the defining everywhere? Because somehow you have defined it everywhere. <laughs> you just have given polynomials here. So I mean, it may happen that given a rational map for some points in here, in V, you get that the image that actually all the Fi are equal to zero. So somehow you are trying to send a point in here to 0, 0, 0, 0, everything 0. But this is not a point on the predictive space. So then it is not well defined. So, I mean, if this happens, it's not that bad. You still call it a rational map, but somehow it is not defined in that point. So if you want a rational map to be a morphism, the condition is that it is actually well defined. So it is defined everywhere. Okay, so what is nice about having a a ras even a, a, a rational map, but let's think about amorphism. So let phi be amorphism. Then we have, in a natural way, an induced map from the function field of W to the function field of B. How easy? You start with a function here, and you just set that function to the composition with phi. And because those are fields, we know that, I mean, a morphism of fields, it is constant or injective. So we can prove that it is not constant if phi is non-constant via non-constant morphism, and then what happens is that this is actually an inclusion. So we can see this field inside this field. So we can see this field as an extension of this field. And we may define the degree of a morphism as the degree of this field inside that one. So as follows. Okay. So now I can define, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> today is like many definitions, <laughs> one after the other. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe you know some of them, maybe you don't know some of them, so, I mean, it's good. <laughs> Next definition, what is a divisor? A divisor on a variety X, well, let me call it B, because I'm calling B the variety all the time. A divisor on V, actually, I mean, this set is a set of divisors, and this is the free Avilian group generated 
So I'm going to write it, it's going to be so long, then I'm going to write it with symbols and you will see it's easy. So it's the free affiliate group generated by the close subvarieties of codimension 1. So basically, I mean, this thing, you can write it as the this that you can write as a formal sum of closed subvarieties of codimension 1 and the ni are integers and the ni are equal to 0 except for a finite number. So basically you just can look at the divisor as formal sums of symbols like this where the white are those closed varieties of the codimension one. So particular example, imagine that our variety is a curve. A curve is a variety of dimension one. So codimension one means dimension zero. So basically for a curve, a divisor is just a formal sum like this with points. Here the whites are going to be points on the variety. Mm. Okay, so what is the nice thing about the divisors? That actually the divisors come up in a natural way when you consider functions on your variety and you look at the zero locus of those functions. And then you are going to get divisors in a natural way. So this is why I defined uh, those uh, divisors. And now let's look at the zero locus of functions on varieties. And we are going to define something that is called the order. And I mean, it's really going to, you're going to think about the valuations. I mean, it's kind of the same philosophy that is behind. Actually, they are valuations. <laughs> so we are going to define the order at a sub close variety of codimension one. So this is a function that takes functions different from zero, sorry, p, and produce an integer. So somehow this function that exists, what I want to measure with it, so I mean you think, take a function, take a function of a variety. So if I look at the zero locus of this function, so I mean I look at where it is equal to zero, this is going to give me something of codimension one. Because I mean it's a closed uh, variety that is given by one equation. So this gives codimension one. So I can see at this function at how many times it is equal to zero. So like the multiplication, the yeah, the multiplication of getting equal, the multiplicity of getting equal to zero. So I mean maybe thinking this with some varieties is a little bit difficult, but you may think about a function on a curve. So you can have a zero of this function. So this function may be equal to zero in a point, but you want to say how much it is equal to zero, right? I mean, this is something that we can think about examples. So for instance, this function is, has a zero at zero, and it's like a simple zero, right? But you may also consider like a parabola, right? And then it also has a zero at zero, but it's like a multiple zero, like it's like a deeper zero, <laughs> like it touch the, x axis more. And I mean, basically this means that the tangent is parallel to this, right? And I mean, I'm going to do it here because otherwise you are not going to see it well. You can get something that even is like a higher zero. So you can get something like this, that is like an inflection point, right? So somehow you want to measure how big is that zero for this function. And I mean, this is like in a point, but now for varieties is co-dimension one. So you may define this order as the order at which the function becomes equal to zero on this uh, sub-variety. So I'm not going to do the precise construction. Actually, for instance, for curves, you can look at the maximal ideals MP that we defined before. So those maximal ideals for curves, they are generated only for, by one element. So you can give like a very precise definition of what is the order of a function by looking at the function of that ideal or of a multiple of that ideal. 
but I'm not going to do the construction in general, but I'm just going to give you the properties. So the intuition is this, and now we'll see which ones are the properties. So we have that the order of the product of two functions is equal to the sum of the orders. This is natural, right? Mm. We also have that there exists only finitely many closed varieties of co-dimension one wide such that the order is greater than zero. So I mean, this is just saying that a function has a finite number of zeros. <laughs> it's much easier set like this, right? Mm. If it is not constant, right? Mm. The order is greater than zero if and only if, as I said, we have that the function is equal to zero on all the points on the subvariety. And then you have this classical result that when I do the sum through all the closed subvarieties of dimension one, such that the order is different from zero. So they are only a finite number of them because of this result. Uh, then the sum of the orders is equal to zero. So what's the meaning of this? Actually, the meaning of this is that the number of poles plus the number of zeros, so I mean, I'm thinking now on a function in a curve, so the zero locus of the function, they are just points. So the number of zeros equals the number of poles. So this is just the meaning of this condition. But I mean, this is like in general for varieties. Okay. So now the funny thing is that attached to a function, I can attach a divisor, right? So given a function in here, assume different from zero, then I can define the divisor attached to a function as the sum, again, same sum than before, and I do the order of y of f at y times i. So this gives me a divisor. Something more about the divisors, funny. So I mean, I just saw before how starting with a morphism between varieties, we have an induced morphism on function fields that it is a contravariant, right? I have to switch the places of V and W, but we also have a induced morphisms from the divisors of W to the divisors of B. What is the idea here? So imagine that I start with a divisor here that I write like this. So what can I get here? So I do the same thing, but now white is a subvariety on W, and I want to get a subvariety of V. What can I do? The pre-match. So this defines a map from here to here. So here should be understood that actually the pre-image is more than one variety. So well, I mean, this sum is going to have more terms. But then with this, we have it. OK, so now we have all this relation between functions, divisors, and morphisms. And I mean, this is going to be very useful. So we are going to say, we are going to define now the linear equivalence on divisors. So this is going to be an equivalence class that says that two divisors are equivalent. We define it in this way. If and only if there exists a function on the variety such that the difference of the two divisors is equal to the divisor associated to this function. So this is the, the definition. And with this, we can define something that is going to be very useful. So I mean, I'm thinking now that my variety is a smooth. OK, let's forget about singular points. So everything that I'm saying now is only for smooth varieties. So I mean, with this equivalent relation, because I mean, the divisor uh, group is like very big, right? 
So, I mean, we have all those symbols given by subvarieties. But now we have defined this equivalent relation. So, we can do the Gaussian, and we have, this is by definition, the Picard group of our uh, variety is equal to the group of divisors, sorry, P, Gaussian, the linear equivalence that we have just defined. And this gives a group that is going to be very useful, you will see later. Mm. Actually, what is going to be very useful is a subgroup of this group. So we may define the degree of a divisor, D. So assume D is equal to this thing. This is equal to the sum of the n y. So we define peak zero equal to the divisors in here of degree zero. So exercise check that actually this is a subgroup. And even more that this is well defined. <laughs> and actually this is because uh, divisors here are equivalent. I mean, in order to be equivalent, they need to have the same degree. Because the degree of a divisor coming from a function is equal to zero because of the property four that we saw before, right? I mean, again, this is a condition about the number of poles being equal to the number of zeros. Okay, so what else can we define now? Yeah, so I'm coming back. So, I mean, everything is related. This is the problem. Uh, I'm coming back to the differential forms that we define. So we can also define the divisor for a um, differential form. So how do we do this? This is going to be equal. We do the same thing that with the, with the functions. We define this as the order at y of this uh, differential times the corresponding closed subvariety. So we have to define this order for the... Um, so this time it's not for a function, but for a differential. So how we do this? So we have to write t in terms of local coordinates. So we have to write this like this by using the relations that I gave with the local parameters that I defined before. And then we define the or order of this uh, di uh, <laughs> differential form as the sum of the orders of fi plus, no, without nothing, like this. So in this way, we can extend the order function also to differential forms. So we can construct also divisors associated to, to differential forms. And now I need to give you another definition before, <laughs> and is that a divisor, D, is called effective and is writing in this way, saying that it is greater than zero, if all the n y are greater or equal than zero, okay? So now with this, I can define the regular differential form as the set omega one. So I write here regular that is equal to the forms, differential forms, such that the associated divisor is effective, so greater than zero. So now this happened that this is again a vector space over, because recall, this one, the differential forms, they were a vector space over the function field of the variety. This one is a vector space over k. So, I mean, this is really a, a subset of this thing. 
The dimension of this vector space was the dimension of the variety. And now the dimension of this another vector space, dimension of this, is by definition, well, sorry, I'm going too fast. <laughs> this is a vector space over k, and it is finite if the dimension of b is equal to 1. So if b is a curve. And in this case, we define the genus of the curve as g equal definition. So this is the genus of the curve to the dimension of this vector space of regular differentials. So this construction is like super abstract, I know, and it's like difficult. We had to define like a lot of things before in order to get the genus. But what is the genus? The genus is just the topology invariant that we know. So when the curve is defined over the complex numbers, you know, so C over the complex number curve. So it is a Riemann surface. I don't know if you have followed some differential geometry course or something like this, but this is a typical thing that we know. So those curves can be classified so by the number of holes. So you may have a sphere, you may have something like this, like a donut with one hole, you may have something with two holes or with three. Actually, I'm going to say it. My research is with this, those curves, with genus 3, <laughs> with three holes. So this is for another course, but I could tell you why <laughs> I'm very interested in these curves. And basically, the genus that we have just defined is just, the, in this setting, it's just the number of holes. So g is equal to the number of holes. Mm, OK, very well. So what else do we need? So yeah. A last thing about the divisors. So I'm going to define, I can associate another <laughs> vector space, a different one, oops, to a divisor. So that is like this. And this is called the Riemann rock space associated to the divisor D. And it is given by the functions, non constant ones, such that this sum gives an effective uh, divisor. So greater or equal than zero. To this, I add the zero, and this is a vector space. <laughs> so this is again, this is a vector space over k of dimension L of d. Mm. Now I can define what it is a linear system. So a linear system L is a sub space, a vector sub space of a Riemann rock space associated to a divisor. Mm, imagine that I take a basis of L, F0 to FR, I don't know, the dimension that it has, this vector space, then I can associate to this, and this is kind of magic, a morphism. From, this is associated to L, even if I fixed a basis, so it depends on the basis. From the variety to P, R minus one. R is the dimension. Ah, no, because I started in zero. Sorry, R. So uh, uh, here actually I have R plus one elements. How can I construct it? Easy. I take a point P and I send it to this point. R. 
So linear systems are nice ways of getting morphisms. And this we are really going to use it. This is going to be very useful in the, in the next lectures. Mm, definition, the base point of L, a linear system, are the points in the intersection of the support of all divisors in L. So the support are the... I, I don't remember now if I define the support of a divisor, so I'm just going to define it again, just in case. <laughs> so if we have B equal to this sum, the support of D is equal to the white such that this is different from zero. And I mean, this we said that is equal to zero and white for almost every all white. So it is not equal to zero only for a finite number of places. So actually this support is a finite set. So I can do the intersection of all those things and get a finite thing. And this is the base point of L. Mm. We say that L is very ample if the morphism phi L that I define there is an embedding. In the same way, we say that D is very ample if the linear system, the complete linear system, the Riemann rock space associated to D is ample, is very ample. And we say last definition, I'm going to erase this, it's going to be very short. D is ample if and D is very ample for some natural N. Okay, so I mean after all those definitions about um, divisors and their properties, I'm going to give you a last theorem. I'm not going to do the proof, but I'm going to give you a reference. <laughs> I'm going to give you a theorem that we are going to use in lectures four and five about divisors. So the theorem is as follows. And I mean, it doesn't have a name, but I'm directly going to give you the reference just in case you want to check the proof. So, I mean, this is a theorem that is called, it's complicated, A323, <laughs> weird name, but I mean, this is a notation in the, I'm going to write it next to it. This is in the Antri Silverman uh, book. So, I mean, if you are curious about the proof, you just can go on and check it. So, the theorem is as follows, it says, that for every divisor that we take for our variety, then there exists a decomposition of our divisor as D1 minus D2 with both of them very ample. So not only ample, but very ample divisors. So this result is going to be useful in the future, in the lectures four and five, because I mean, the idea is that we're going to be able to define like nice height for ample divisors. And we are going to be willing to extend those definitions for general divisors. So because we are going to have kind of additive properties as the one that we saw in lecture two, uh, this kind of decomposition is going to be useful to define those heights. Okay, very well. So now after this theory about divisors, I'm going to say a few words about abelian varieties. So, I mean, of course, <laughs> abelian varieties is like a really big uh, topic. So, I mean, you could read like books and books about abelian varieties, but I mean, I'm just going to give like a, if you already know what is an abelian variety, <laughs> you are done. <laughs> if you have never seen it, Okay, so maybe this is a fast introduction and maybe not for the things I'm telling later. 
And of course, if you are curious and you want to get to know more about abelian varieties, please ask me and I can give you thousands of references, okay? <laughs> so what it is an abelian variety? Actually, an abelian variety, it is a variety. So as the one that we saw, with an extra condition. There it is a group two. So basically that means that I can take two points on the abelian variety and I can add those points. So I mean the group I'm considering like the group law is addition. So it means that I can add points on the abelian variety. So now you can say okay but this I can just define the addition as I want, right? So I mean, is that a strong, that condition? And actually it is, because I'm not only going to ask that we have a group, but that the group law has nice properties. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean is that the translation by a point P, meaning that if I, I have a point Q on the abelian variety, so in general, abelian varieties are denoted by A, because of the abelian, if you want, instead of by V. That could be like a variety that is maybe not a billion. So, I mean, this is the translation by P. That means that given any point on the abelian variety A, I consider the addition of the point like this. So, I mean, this is a map and I have another map that is the inverse, right? So given a point on the abelian variety, I can produce the inverse. And again, because I said that the group law is an additive law, so I, the inverse is denoted by minus Q. So what I want, like once that I have this group law on, on my variety, what I want is that this translation by P and this map that gives you the inverse are morphisms. So this is the definition of what it is an abelian variety. So, I mean, nice consequences that you get about this, and I mean, this is the name, right? Abelian. <laughs> so, yeah, you are guessing <laughs> that you have a group, and actually you have an abelian group, indeed. So, this is the, the first property. Um, the group is abelian. So, this can be proved. I can give you references of that. Like, ones that, I mean, you, you may prove that you have morphisms like this that satisfy the usual conditions when you have a group law, then you can deduce that this group law has to be commutative, so that the group is abelian. And this is why the abelian varieties are not group varieties, because you can say something else. Um, okay, and then an example of morphisms that you have for those abelian varieties. So, example of other morphisms. is that in a natural way, you may define the following. So it's like a generalization of this last map. Instead, like the inverse, I denote it like multiplication by minus one, but you can be actually in general, multiplication by m. And what is this? So you just take a point here, and then you send it to p plus p plus p m times. So I didn't see it, of course, I mean, this definition is when m is positive, but actually you can also do it when m is negative, because then you are going to do like minus p plus minus p plus minus p, the absolute time, uh, the absolute value of m times. So you may define that. Okay, so this is about abelian varieties. So now let's see an example of an abelian variety, and I guess that this you know about it. So elliptic curves. Elliptic curves. are abelian varieties of dimension one. So, because they are curves. So, an elliptic curve is an abelian variety, which means it's a variety, and that it's a group, an abelian group, and because it is a curve, it has dimension one. So, I mean, those are like the um, easiest examples among the abelian varieties. So you know that, I mean, elliptic curves in general, at least when the characteristic of the field is different from two and three, are given by what is called a Weierstrass model. That is an equation that just looks like this. And well, I mean, uh, in the exercise list, you have like several examples of, 
of elliptic curves and I mean you will see it. this is going to be lecture five now you're going to have a lot of exercises with elliptic curves and counting the number of rational points and using the heights on elliptic curves you will see you will have fun okay but more examples because actually you are interested in even a little bit more general examples so I mean as I said not all Avelian uh, not all varieties are Avelian varieties so not for all varieties you can define a group and in the same way if we look at varieties of dimension one so curves curves in general they are not Avelian varieties in fact the only curves that they are Avelian varieties are elliptic curves and that they are curves of genus one but now what happens if I get C a curve of genus G and let's say that G is greater than greater or equal than 2 so we are not in the case of an elliptic curve. So in this case, this is not an abelian variety, but we can construct an abelian variety attached to C. So we can construct an abelian variety associated to C. And this Abelian variety is called the Jacobian of C. So we write it like this. And what's the definition? And I mean, this is nice because now I'm like putting together everything that we saw before. So actually, the definition of the Jacobian it is just the Picard group that we saw associated to the curve where I only take the, divis the divisors of degree zero. So basically the Jacobian of the curve can be defined because actually there are many equivalent <laughs> definitions <laughs> mm, but I mean this is like I think that the easiest with the things that we have seen. Uh, the Jacobian it is just the Picard group, the divisors of degree zero on the Picard group and recall that this is actually the divisors of degree zero uh, and we do the equivalent relation, we consider the equivalent relation of being linearly equivalent, that means that the difference between two divisors is an effect, um, principal divisor, so the divisor associated to a function. And the nice thing is that if we already have a rational point in the curve, so assume we have a point here, then we can construct, actually for any choice of the point that we make here on the curve, we can, uh, we obtain an embedding of the curve into the Jacobian, okay? And this is done as follows. So I take any point of the curve, how can I see it as something inside here? I have to produce a divisor of degree zero, right? And voila, here it is, the idea of how to do it. So we have an embedding of our curve. So yes, um, I mean, I, I'm not proving it, <laughs> but you could prove it, that the dimension, because I mean, the Jacobian is a variety, so we can talk about its dimension. We already said that it is not a curve, okay? So it doesn't have dimension one, but what is its dimension? And actually, its dimension happened to be the genus of the curve. So again, if you knew about Avelian varieties, this is a quick <laughs> summary of the things that you know. If you didn't know, maybe I went so fast. But on the other hand, maybe I just gave you like the very few things that you need to follow the course without going into all the details of the Avelian varieties um, theory that is behind. So just before finishing, I'm going to do an example because as I'm telling you all the time, I love examples. <laughs> and I think that examples are, well, for me at least, is what I need to really assimilate all the theory, all the definitions, and all the results. So I'm just going to do a um, kind of example. Maybe I'm omitting some of the computations, so you can do them as an exercise to double check. But in this way, you will have like a general view of all the things that we have seen during this lecture three. So, example, I'm going to consider, well, not a curve, but well, a priori not a curve, but a variety. So, I'm going to look at this ideal, so generated by these two homogeneous polynomials. 
So for you, exercise to check that it is irreducible, so it is a prime ideal. So it defines a variety. So, I mean, this variety that I'm going to call V, associated to this ideal, is contained in P3, because I have four variables, right? I have X, Y, Z, and T. So, I mean, it's not a plain curve, that maybe all the examples that you always see, they are plain curves. So, I mean, I try to show you something different. So, we have this curve. Okay, very well. Sorry, not curve. I haven't proved yet that it is a curve, but it's going to be a curve. <laughs> we have this variety. Uh, we can uh, construct to it the coordinate tree that recall that by definition, so is this, and I do the quotient by the ideal. Mm, I can construct the field of fraction of this, and this is going to be the function field, right? So this is the fraction field of the coordinate frame. And if I look at the ideals, I'm going to produce a chain of ideal. So I have, this is a prime ideal, zero. This is contained in, for instance, this ideal. That is, again, a prime ideal, because, I mean, this polynomial is reducible and there is only one generator. And this is contained in I, right? Mm. So why I did this? Because if I want to compute the dimension on B, Recall that this is equal to the cruel dimension of the ideal associated to our variety, right? So, I mean, what is the length of this chain? The length of the chain is equal to one, because we start by zero, <laughs> and we want prime ideals inside our ideal. So this would be with the notation before the P0, and this is a P1. So this is the longest chain of ideal that we could produce. So this dimension is equal uh, to one. And then we have that the dimension of V is equal to one. So it is a curve. Okay, very well. So now I want to check if there are singular points on this curve. So we saw two different ways of checking when a curve is singular or not. So, one idea is that I can look at, um, at the localization, right, at this maximal idea. So I'm going to take this point. Because, I mean, I told you, this is the first definition, that this is the intrinsic one. So it is nice, but actually in practice, it's a little bit hard to work with this one. So this is why I want to do an example. And then I'm going to look at the other definition that is like the easy one. So, okay, I need to look at the functions that they are equal to zero at this point for this uh, polynomial. So, I mean, of course, I have x, I have z, because I have zeros here, and then I need something else that corresponds to those coordinates, so I can get, for instance, uh, um, y minus t. I can even deshomogenize and make y equal to 1. And actually, this, I can see it like this, right? Uh, but then, in this situation, notice that x is actually, because I'm deshomogenized, so I made y equal to 1, x is equal to z squared. And then, I can also make y equal to 1 in this equation. And actually, if I do that, what I get so again, this is deshomogenization y equal to 1. The first equation gives me a t squared minus 1 that I can rewrite in this way equal to this. This is a function that is not equal to 0 in my point, right? So I can divide, I can put this as a denominator. So I get that t minus 1 is actually equal to something generated by x and z. But x is already generated by z. So with all this, we conclude that this ideal is just generated by z. And then once that we have this, 
let me write it here, we have that the square of this ideal is generated by set square, right? And then we have that the quotient of this ideal by this ideal is the thing generated by set, quotient the thing, the thing uh, generated by set square. So we have only one generator and this gives us the dimension of the variety that was equal to one as we computed. So this point is a smooth. So yeah, it was a little bit of work and even it was only for one point. <laughs> so it's not that useful. So now let me do it with the general method that is going to work for all the points. So we can check at the same time if all the points are singular or not, or if there is any singular point. So for this, I just compute the Jacobian. Uh, this is not the Jacobian of the abelian variety. <laughs> this is the Jacobian matrix associated to the, to the ideal. So I mean, I take the two equations defining the, um, the ideal, and I consider the partial derivative. So for the first equation, I get this. And for the second equation, I get this. And we have that the rank of this matrix is equal or has to be equal, is the question, to 3. This 3 comes from the dimension of the projective space minus the dimension of the variety. That in our case, we check that it is a curve. The dimension is 1, 3 minus 1, equal to 2. So basically, in order to get that a point is a smooth, we need that the rank of this matrix has to be equal to 2. So basically, we need that these two lines are not linearly dependent. OK, so it's easy to check that if t is different from 0, then this line is going to be linearly independent from this one. And this line cannot be all equal to 0, right? Because if this line is all equal to 0, we will have this. But this, if we look at the first equation, so recall that the first equation was t squared equal to the sum of the squares of x, y, and z. So if these three are equal to 0, this implies t equal to 0, but this is a contradiction because, I mean, there is no projective point with all coordinates equal to 0. So we cannot have this three thing equal to 0. So if t is different from 0, then the rank is 2. So we have, <laughs> that means a smooth point. OK, now let's consider the less last case. So if t is equal to 0. OK, so if t is equal to 0, and we still want to have rank equal to 2, what we need is that this thing is not a multiple of this thing, right? But in order to get if t equal to 0, then we need that those vectors are parallel ones, right? But here we have 2 times z and minus 2 times z. So there are two options. If z different from 0, then this line to be equal to this line we need to be everything with a minus, right? So we need x equal to 2 times y and y equal to 2 times x. But this implies x equal to 4 times x, right? <laughs> Which is weird. So this implies x equal to y equal to 0. But if x is equal to y equal to 0 because of the second equation that would set a square equal to x, y, implies z equal to 0. And this is a contradiction with this assumption. So we don't have points with that. OK, so the other option is that z is equal to 0. So now, if we have t equal to 0 and z equal to 0, then it implies that x or y is equal to 0, because z squared is equal to this. So this implies x or y equal to 0. But then, because of the other equation, we 
once that we make x or y equal to zero and z equal to zero and d equal to zero, <laughs> then we get that actually both are equal to zero. But again, this is not possible. So there is no way that the rank of this matrix is different from two. So rank of j is always equal to two. So there is no singular point. We really have a smooth variety. A small observation, actually this is not completely true. Somehow I'm assuming that the characteristic of the field is different from two. What is happening if the characteristic of the field is equal to two? But then this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. And actually the rank of this matrix is never equal to two. Actually it's like a funny example because it happened there is a variety that is singular everywhere. <laughs> so you really have a lot of singularities. So I'm just going to leave this like a remark. In characteristic of the field equal to two, then V is singular. In particular, this is an example of a variety that if we are over the rationals, in characteristic zero, we have good reduction, we have um, that it is smooth, but the reduction at two has bad reduction because in characteristic two, there are singular points that come up. So this is an interesting example. Mm, okay, so now I think that I'm going to stop here. I hope that the example was useful <laughs> for you. Um, and again, this lecture was a little bit weird because actually if you already knew the things, you can skip, skip it. And I hope you did it and you are not still listening to me. <laughs> In case you only needed, you only knew a little bit, then I hope that it's good because I just told you like the few things you need to know to keep going with the next lectures. And in case you really don't know the level, this is the first time that you see this. So, I mean, I really encourage you to, to look at the references that I gave you at the beginning of the lecture. And of course, to ask me all the questions that, that you want. Okay, so with this, we are done for lecture three. See you in lecture four, bye. <laughs>